Okay. So, well, today we're going to be talking about one of the most important immigrations to Peru. Uh, we are going to be focusing in the Asian immigration. And uh, this is going to be the first one of a series of different episodes dedicated to the immigrations to Peru. So uh, we are going now to start. And let me now share the pictures. So um, first of all, uh, Peru is known as the country of the Incas, is known as the country of the, um, let's say, pre-Hispanic societies, of wonderful pre-Hispanic societies. But um, we are so much more than that. And in today's lecture, we are going to learn how important, especially the Chinese and the Japanese cultures have been um, in this in this nation, and we're going to talk about some personalities related with these uh, immigrations too. Okay, so well, um, first of all, to start this uh, very important um, conversation about the Asian influences in Peru and especially in Lima, because we're going to talk a lot about Lima and the impact of the Chinese and Japanese here in the city. Uh, let me tell you that the presence of the Chinese and the Japanese goes back in time, you know, like until the colonial era, back to the colonial era. And something very important is that um, in the colonial times, there was not a mass immigration from Asia, of course, because of the distances, no? because of the, the, the contact between Asia and America was very, very uh, limited. But it's really interesting to, uh, to find that, for example, in the census of the year 1613, uh, there is a, um, a fragment, let's say, uh, of this census in which it is pointed out a small group of Asians here in Lima. Uh, it is not very clear if they were uh, Chinese, Japanese, Filipinos, but uh, possibly were either Chinese or Japanese. That is more and more uh, possible. And they were a very small group. There were about three persons so far we know in this very old uh, document. And the reason why I'm showing you this image is because uh, this is one of the most important and oldest structures we have in the historic center of Lima. This is the Puente Trujillo or Trujillo, Trujillo Bridge, also known as the Stone Bridge. Um, so the Stone Bridge was built in the year 1610. And we know that in the construction of that bridge, there was a group of Asian men working. Oh, so we don't know their names. We don't know their original hometowns, but we know that these people were working as albañiles, which means basically, you know, like a, um, con in construction, no, they were part of the construction. Uh, so this bridge is still is nowadays existing in the historic center. And also what you can see in the distance is, for example, the big towels that you see belong to the church of cathedral, the cathedral of Lima, and also the church that is more like closer to the bridge, Oh, uh, that church is gone. We don't have it anymore. That is the Desamparados Church. So um, this is also a very interesting thing, no? Uh, we know that there was a very small Asian presence here in Peru in the early colonial days. Uh, as I was saying, no, uh, in the year 1858-1859 is when the first group of Chinese arrived to Peru. And what you're seeing here is a clipper. The clippers were the ships that were used back then to bring Chinese to uh, Peru. And these uh, ships were started to be used uh, in North America, actually were created in North America during the time of the gold fever, the gold rush. Uh, and these ships were so fast that that say made the navigations between Asia and for example, Peru in some few weeks, basically, uh, a month and a half approximately. Before that, the time of, for sailing uh, between Asia and Peru was approximately three months. No? So it saved half of the time for the uh, people that were especially uh, making money from the trade 
of Chinese. We will talk about that in a little bit in, in a few uh, minutes. And um, people that were making lots of money from that trade, uh, it was better for them because they were not needing to spend that much money, especially in food for the Chinese people up on board. Mm -hmm. So we know that approximately 100,000 Chinese men arrived in the Republican times. Also, it's a huge, a huge number. 100,000 Chinese men came in approximately 50 years since the mid uh, 19th century until the very early 20th century when finally the trade of Chinese, let's say, and the immigration stopped. And this is one of the pictures of Chinese men on the fields. This is a cotton field. Most of the Chinese men came uh, with, first of all, big dreams, thinking that in here in Peru, they will be able to make a good living, um, thinking that there would be for them a possibility of a better future. Unfortunately, for um, all of these people, uh, what they found here was a situation of semi-slavery. Most of them were treated as slaves, and the reason is because, first of all, in the year 1854, Peru, or the president of that time, uh, Mr. Ramon Castilla, known as the Lincoln of Peru, he uh, abolished the slavery, right? So this could be something very good, very positive. But in reality, the situation of the slaves got worse because now they were free, so nobody was taking care of them. Right? Nobody was making sure they were having jobs, food, any possibilities of development. So the masters of this slave were getting rid of them. But now they were needing cheap laborers to come to work their land. So the president, uh, Ramon Castilla, and also his ministers back then came to the conclusion that the best option was importing cheap laborers, right? So these cheap laborers, well, uh, were taken from Canton or Guangdong, no? also known like this in, in Chinese, Canton, more known in Latin America, which is in the south of China. And um, the trade started. So most of the Chinese men that came to Peru, they were escaping from extreme poverty. China also um, was uh, having big, big problems ethnic fights also within China back then in the 19, sorry, 1830s, 1840s, and also the beginning of the wars of opium or opium wars, right? In which, well, many, many Chinese lost their lives and also many more had no opportunities of making any profits. So China was already very, very poor. And um, these people were just, looking to go out, no? Many of them went to North America, by the way, no? The coolies, right? And also many came to Peru. So before going on board on a ship, uh, what happened is that, uh, first of all, uh, they were recruited, no? So um, some people that were representatives of the government of Peru, because all of this was done in the level of the government, it was not a private business. So the government, let's say, support all of this. So these people will be going there and will be checking the conditions of these men, which were in general terms, all men. Men, very young, right? Uh, so they were given contracts to work for a space of, in most of the cases, five years, right? But um, this situation changed later. I will tell you why, no? In most of the times, these people ended up working for up to 10 years, uh, tied with very unfair contracts to their Peruvian masters. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's say, well, most of them were tied to contracts initially of five years in which, well, they will be uh, well, working sometimes in plantations. Sometimes they were put to work in the construction of railroads because that was the time of the development of the railroads in Peru. And also in some cases, they ended up working in the Guano Islands, um, which um, most likely many of them had no idea they would be ending up to do. 
So this is something that unfortunately uh, for many of these people uh, was not very clear in the beginning because their contracts which were made in Spanish and also their contracts that were in Chinese were not necessarily similar in some cases. Um, so well, um, these contracts were given to them and uh, they traveled to Peru, you know, for this month and a half, assinated in some cases in terrible conditions because nobody was really focusing in the situation of these Chinese men. And well, finally, they, they came to Peru. Let me show you this picture, which is also one of the most uh, impacting to me because you can see a coolie, right? In Spanish, we call coolies, oh, the, the Chinese men of, of that time. Nobody nowadays is called coolie anymore, but this coolie, oh, look at what he has. He's in shackles. He has shackles in his feet. And uh, this is the way how this coolies were treated. So how come this is possible, right? There was no more slavery, but that was in the paper. In the reality, many of these masters of the you know, owners of sugar, sugar cane plantations, cotton plantations, their mind setting was still, you know, like possessing slaves and they pay for contracts that were uh, sort of like negotiated with them. So the, the, the masters paid for the contracts, but um, sometimes, you know, they were paying for also the, uh, all the, the needs of these Chinese on board, uh, which were lots, of course, There's, there was a lot of expenses there. And then when the Chinese came to Lima, they had to be taken to the, you know, the farming zones, which were far, far away from the capital. So there was a lot of money involved in that. Uh, so in most of the cases, these this men thought of these Chinese as their slaves. And in order for them to make sure that the Chinese will not escape once they were in the work, they put them shackles. Mm -hmm. And also something that is even more atrocious for me is that the black, Af the African men, the black men, which were former slaves, Sometimes they had no other, you know, like way to do any other thing. They were, they were not trained. They had no education. So they were paid by their former owners to work controlling the Chinese men. So many of these black men, what they did was punishing the Chinese, you know, like showing what they were shown. Oh, and, and, and we can imagine also there was a lot of this resentment in them in which they mistreated the Chinese, in which they beat them and, and used lashes. So this is, this is a really awful story. And this is something sometimes Peruvians forget because we tend, we tend to think of ourselves as the victims all the time, you know, all oh, the conquests, all the Spaniards, but this is very important to never forget that also we made our own mistakes as society, as a nation. And this is also we're going to take us into another part in which we will talk about the discrimination towards the Chinese once the Chinese were freed uh, from their contracts. So, um, well, many of these Chinese, as I said before, had contracts that originally tied them to their master for five years. But the problem is that, uh, for example, if the master consider that the Chinese men uh, uh, like exceed, let's say, the expenses of, of the master, so the master will ask this person to work for an additional time like to compensate the expenses this person did. So sometimes it would be for three more years or up to five years more. So that's why we know that in between eight to 10 years was the average these people were tied to their masters. Um, also, well, uh, the payments were very low, very minimal, really nobody care on, on checking on, on how much the Chinese were paid, but something they were always given, they were never denied was rice because most of them were paid with rice and rice is the base of the food of the Chinese men. So that's why they were always given their, you know, their part of rice. And this is very important to be taken in consideration because later 
We will talk about a little bit of the Chifa food and the influence of the Chinese people in, and also the importance of rice nowadays in our culture, but um, also the rice in the Chinese way too, you know, the chow fang or the fried rice, which is also very, very delicious and is part of Peruvian uh, cuisine now. Uh -huh. So let's check uh, next one. So, um, well, as you can see, the fashion of the Chinese men who came in the 19th century, mid 19th century, which was this one, attracted a lot the attention of the of the local people, no? And um, this is unfortunately something that uh, for many, uh, these looks uh, for many were sort of like um, not so pleasing to the eye. They look very strange. They talk a strange, yellow skin. You know, that uh, coleta that we call the, which is the, the, the braid, uh, the braided hair in the back, very unusual or very, very big, uh, like our shirts and pants. So um, it was very easy for people to notice right away when someone was Chinese uh, or, or uh, Asian. And uh, this also um, created, uh, let's say, uh, visible gaps between Asians and Peruvians of that time. Uh, so the discrimination was very big since the beginnings, but um, many Chinese uh, eventually, once they were uh, freed from their contracts, they even got married to Peruvians. So, and they started to create families, Peruvian Chinese, Chinese Peruvian families. And most of them, because they were seen as outcasted, started to live in the zones that were out in the outskirts of the historic center of Lima, for example. Lima was very small back then. You know, the main square of Lima is the center of the city. But back in the colonial days or back in the early Republican times, Lima was not really much bigger than, well, what nowadays we know is the historic center. So a few blocks away, about five blocks away from the main square, we have the central market. And the central market is where most of these Chinese men end up you know, living. And um, there also they met indigenous women oh, or mestizo women, oh, uh, uh, women of low rank oh, uh, and also some of them very poor. So they were able eventually to unite. And there is an element that I find also really interesting. The fact that these Chinese people uh, were isolated in the, in the plantation fields, they were not able to speak well Spanish because uh, they had no chance to, to have a connection with, with people that spoke Spanish. And also these indigenous women, which they spoke Spanish, but most of the time their first language was not Spanish, was Quechua right which were also discriminated too so this is there is an element in common that possibly made very very easy you no know, the, the contact of these people the reciprocity of affections oh and eventually well created this very very beautiful union you know, of, of two cultures that you know created one really really important huh so um also Continuing with, with this period of the history of the Chinese, you know that uh, these Chinese men, which work in uh, hacienda houses, no, in the plantation fields, um, if they, for example, got sick, if they were ill, the medicine was not really very good back then, and especially for coolies, no, nobody will be spending money in saving the life of a coolie. So if they die, because they were not Christian, if, because they were not Catholic, they couldn't be buried in a cemetery, a Christian cemetery or a Catholic cemetery. So um, nowadays in many archeological sites located in the city of Lima, for example, and also many, many more around the country where the Chinese were working in the Republican times, there are evidences of burials of Chinese people. Mm -hmm. And for example, this is the case of one of them in which, um, by the way, this is located in the Huaca Mateo Salado, one archeological site located very close to the historic center of Lima. Um, it was discovered the body of this Chinese man that was dressed up in the traditional fashion of the man, like the picture we saw before. And also uh, next to this person, 
you know, some coins, oh, uh, which uh, were also part of the tradition for these for these people. Uh, also, um, their pipes for smoking opium, their chopsticks also. Not really many, many things, many objects, but objects that were valuable for them. And in most of the cases, their contracts. And thanks to that, we know the names of many of these Chinese. But when they came to Peru uh, and they were sent to work to the plantation fields, uh, they were not, uh, their, their original names were not respected. Their names were usually changed. And this is also important to nowadays trace back some of the Chinese names that we have in Peru. Uh, some of the Chinese men, for example, these coolies, were their names um, peronized. Oh, so uh, for example, if um, their name was Akon, uh, uh, this person will be named Francisco, for example, no? because nobody could pronounce that name, right? It, sometimes uh, their last names will be changed for the last name of the master of the of the hacienda, no? so they will be taking the name, and in some cases this also happened as a way of retribution, as a way of thanking the master, because not all the masters were mean, few were really good, and uh, and even became like godfathers of the children of of some of these. Uh, coolies or former coolies, no? but the cases unfortunately are not so many. Mm -hmm. So, and we will also talk about, you know, other important uh, moment in the history of Peru, uh, which also is related with the Chinese. This is also part of the clothing of the Chinese men discovered in a uh, archeological site. This is the clothes, all the fashion. Um, also showing well, how humbly, hu humbly you know, these people used to dress, how simply. Uh, but also this reminds me another uh, important thing, which is the, uh, the work of these men in the uh, islands of Guano. No? Uh, in the Guano Islands, we have along the coast of Peru, um, which by the way, those islands are not inhabited by humans because there's no uh, sweet water in those islands. The islands in the ocean uh, are desert, never rains there. That's also why we have a huge accumulation of guano, which is the excrement of the seabirds in, in those islands. So, um, it, well, these men were sent to work there in these atrocious situations. And um, many of them were working for years, but honestly, you couldn't work really uh, like a, having a good health for more than a year in those islands because the guano is full of, you know, excrement, excrement basically is full of nitrogen. So, and also other, other elements which are really nauseous for your for your health so uh, being exposed to guano for so prolonged time will kill you either way maybe you will not be killed in the islands but you will be killed later you no know, after finishing your your time of work so also something important is that many many chinese were not coming to work to the islands but many Chinese sign up without having a destination. So they, they just wanna, they, they just enroll, right? So once they came to Lima, um, what happened is that um, the Chinese were put in auctions. I, I hope I'm expressing well uh, like this. So in auctions, but you know, this was the time of the, you know, like uh, abolition of the slavery. So how come that was possible? Well, um, the way how the trick was done is that uh, what was in auction was not the Chinese man. What was in auction was the contract, right? So the contracts were in auction and not the Chinese, which basically was pretty much the same thing, right? But uh, the, the government was trying to, to give a twist to, to that. Mm -hmm. So, okay. And we will talk now about Patricio Lynch briefly. This um, general uh, was uh, Chilean. The reason why I'm talking about this 
personality for Chile, is also a Chilean hero, is uh, because during the time of the War of the Pacific, the war Peru-Chile, the Chinese also took a very, you know, like in, important presence, but in a negative way for, for Peru. I mean, not all Chinese, I don't wanna, you know, be, you know, discriminated in such a way, but many Chinese that were resented to their masters, that were mistreated, treated as slaves and so on, when the war with Chile started and finally reached Lima, especially Lima, in the year 1881, right, the troops of the Chileans disembarked here in the city of Lima and they started to visit different uh, plantation fields, different hacienda houses, you know, there was a big group of, of, of Chileans. They even took the city, by the way. They took the city from, from the year 1881 until 1884, right? So uh, Mr. Patricio Lynch, which was the general of these Chilean troops, right? Uh, was very well spoken in Chinese. So how come he was so good in Chinese? Well, the reason is because during the wars of the opium, the opium wars, Mr. Patricio Lynch used to serve to the British crown. He worked as also a, a, a soldier uh, a, working for the British crown and he went to China and he learned very, very good Chinese. Actually the same Chinese, most Chinese were speaking here, Cantonese. So when he came to Peru and he saw the situation, we Peruvians put the Chinese here, he took advantage of that, right? And he convinced the Chinese to enroll to support the Chileans. And that's what happened. So you can imagine that that also put a lot of fire, no fuel, the animosity many Peruvians, many Limanians had against the Chinese. And for those three years, Many of these Chinese, which were very close to the Chileans, you know, um, actually were treated very well by the Chilean troops. And many even after the war with Chile, when finally the peace was signed uh, and the Chinese, uh, Chileans returned to Chile, many, re many Chinese returned with the Chileans with, to Chile. They went to Chile, they lived there uh, and they were treated quite well. Of course, not all the Chinese were supporters of the Chileans. We are talking about the coolies. Uh, they, they were the ones that were resented. But in the year 1881, there were many Chinese uh, that were the first generation that came uh, in, in the 50s, for example, that had their families here, their businesses here. And uh, they were the ones that after the war with Chile, they were terribly mistreated by the Peruvians. No? So it was a very difficult time for those uh, Chinese. So uh, this is a picture of the Barrio Chino in downtown Lima. Uh, and I was, I was preparing actually a, a virtual tour for, to the Chinatown that um, was supposed to be coming live next week seems that things are not going to permit me for now doing this tour, but this is such an amazing location. And uh, the Chinatown of Lima is also one of the most important of South America. Uh, and this is because of the huge presence of Chinese here in, in Peru. And um, nowadays, for example, we know that about 10% of the population of Peru has Chinese ancestry. So look how much the Chinese uh, not just have, you know, like, um, well, uh, created, you know, their, their relations with Peruvians, had produced seed, uh, but also how rooted the Chinese culture is in us. And we sometimes don't even notice, right? Uh, so this arch, uh, this is an arch that was uh, created to um, let's say um, to commemorate uh, the uh, arrival of the Chinese, especially the first 
150 years of the immigration of Chinese to Peru. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, this arch still exists. And also, I think, well, this is uh, now in color picture. Um, there is a um, phrase in Chinese here, which I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce correctly in Chinese, but I can tell you what it means. And in this phrase, it says, under the sky, all men are equal, mm -hmm. which is a really beautiful, very, very deep, meaningful uh, phrase. So uh, nowadays, the uh, Barrio Chino is known as one of the most popular places, not just to come to do shoppings, also to eat chifa, chifa, the Peruvian Chinese. And chifa comes from the, uh, the phrase, Xifang, Xifang, uh, which is from Chinese, uh, uh, it, it is sort of like a, a, a greeting, right? So when Chinese used to meet back in the Republican times, you know, in this zone, there were many, many fondas or small restaurants in which the Chinese used to work, you know? So this was not yet officially the Chinatown back then, but the local people used to hear that every time the Chinese met, they said to each other, chi fang, chi fang. So, and then immediately after they went to eat uh, at a fonda, at a restaurant. So the local people started you know, to, to make connections between that phrase and the food they were eating. So uh, eventually, every time well, someone was asking about the, the Chinese man and another one saw, well, greeting to another person, this Chinese man. So they said, they started to say, uh, oh, he went to the chi fang. Oh, to the Chifang. And eventually, Chifang became the name of the restaurants where these people uh, were working, where they were serving traditional Cantonese food. So our Chifa is a fusion of Cantonese food and Peruvian cuisine. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, this is, this is a little bit of the story of the Chifa. It is started here in the Chinatown in the Calle Capong and uh, also about the name Capon. Capon comes from the word in Spanish, capar. So what is capar? Capar is castrate, is cercenate, <laughs> is castrate, cercenate the genitals of the pigs, for example. And the reason is because back in the old days, in the, in the colonial days, it was very typical that, that around the market, uh, by the way, uh, let's say to the to the uh, left is the central market, right? So in this zone behind the market it is where most of the animals were, and they were uh, like fatter. Not right? make it make them; uh, they were made uh, fatter. So the way to do it easily was castrating the animals. So in that way, the animals become more peaceful; they don't move too much, and that's a really uh, effective way to make animals gain weight. So that's why the street uh, has the name Calle Capon, because in here, the animals used to be castrated. Uh -huh. So um, also we have a Chinese oracle, uh, is the temple Tom Sin, which is three blocks away from here. I've been able to visit this place once, it's amazing. And they still, this is one of the temples that is still uh, runs in Lima and is the oldest one. It's from the uh, 50s of the uh, 19th century. Uh, so also, uh, and, and to, to finish, well, the, the story of the Chinese here in Peru, we have here a, a very special present that Chinese community gave to Peru for our first hundred years of independence. So this is the Chinese fountain and the Chinese fountain is located in a huge park, which well now also is closed because of the COVID situation. A Parque de la Reserva is a beautiful place. It's one of the biggest parks we have in Lima. And well, all of the communities, important communities, gave us presents uh, during the uh, celebration of the uh, independence, the, the 100, 100 years of the independence. Uh, for example, the Germans gave us uh, the, a towel with a clock. And many people laugh about that because 
Uh, we know we are very impunctual. No, we never go on time anywhere. So the Germans gave us a clock, <laughs> uh, and it's also in downtown Lima. Uh, and also, well, a very good practical joke. And also, a other very beautiful present was an arch, a Moorish arch, uh, given us by the uh, to by the um, Spanish. So the Spanish gave us also another beautiful decoration, making peace also with us and accepting, of course the independence of Peru and accepting us as, as you know, like in, in a good alliance. Uh, and the Chinese gave us this um, very, very fine uh, fountain made in Italy, by the way, uh, in which there are elements related with the peace, uh, uh, the union of these two nations. And I think there's another one in color. Huh? And uh, also we have in, in both sides of this uh, fountain, let me, let me try to leave this section. You can see here uh, a allegory or a representation and another one here uh, of the rivers. One of them is the Amazon River and the other one is the Yellow River which both are very, very important well, for each nation. So, um, well, these are elements that make us you know, more, more united uh, all, all together, no? Uh, in Peru, when we think about Chinese, we think about Chifa and we think about Wong. So what's Wong? Wong is a supermarket. It's a very, very famous supermarket. It, it is everywhere in the country. And Erasmo Wong, actually this man is the grandson of the founder of this supermarket, a, a Chinese man that started just a small business, a small, a small store. And now they are multimillionaire. Mm -hmm. So um, this is one of the best examples of success. Uh, and, and the Chinese people, we always see them as hardworking people, always very united uh, and always, uh, well, together no so this is very important to to be mentioned because in the time times of difficulties they were always together they supported each other and that's how they were able to make it in this nation also one of the best examples in terms of you know like um, immigrants uh, who uh, achieve success mm -hmm. so well here another one of mr erasmo won in the center you know, and well, they really don't need to work anymore <laughs> because they are they are super rich. That's that's fabulous, no? So well, this, this is this is one of the one of the stories. Also, uh, finally, uh, Mr. Edwin Vasquez Cam, uh, also Peruvian Chinese. By the way, to the Peruvian Chinese, we call them Tusan, Tusan, and Tusan uh, is for any generation, right? Of of first generation, second generation, born here in Peru. So all children of Chinese born in Peru are called Tucson. So this man, Tucson, no, Edwin Vasquez Cam, is known as the only uh, athlete, let's say, or, or, or per person, uh, sportsman, who won for Peru a gold medal in an Olympic game. And that was in the year 1947. So uh, this man uh, won in the, uh, sorry, I, I don't know how to pronounce it, shooting, like a, a shooting sport. So the only gold medal, medal Peru has was given to us uh, by Edwin Vasquez Cam in, in an Olympic game, in an Olympic game. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, and... Um, I think we can we can also uh, let's say if if you if you wish we can continue next week with the story of the Japanese and because there's also lots more I don't want to ruin the surprise but we have somewhere around the image of Fujimori so we will be talking about Mr. Fujimori in the next one let me show you aha uh -huh. so in the next class <laughs> in the next lecture we're going to be talking about the history of the Japanese, the importance of the Japanese in terms of culture, what have they given us? Um, well, we will talk about the food of the Japanese fusion with the Peruvian food. And we will talk about uh, Fujimori again, no? very important, a former president of Peru. Uh, so, well, I, I hope you enjoyed very much this lecture today. 
we have for many more lectures also to come. Don't forget, we have the Italian, we have the um, French, we have the British, we have the Polish, and we will be also inviting for that one Marek because he's an expert in the Polish immigration also. So it's been a pleasure to have you today. Thank you very much for your time.